Hey y'all, how you doing today? If you've noticed, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> my hair has become uh, more and more um, non-compliant, I guess would be a good word. What I'm trying to do is I set a goal a couple of months ago to be able to donate my hair and so in order to do that, you need a minimum of eight inches and I've got about five. So we've got about three to maybe four inches more to go. We'll see. I'll probably do four inches so that we get in like nine, 10 inch area so that I actually have hair left when they take it all off. Uh, but basically... Uh, because of the cancer that hit my mother-in-law, it was one of the goals I kind of did to try to show um, compassion or whatever you want to call it um, to my mother-in-law for my wife. And so that's that's kind of what's going on here. Also kind of an update on the house. Uh, we are still kind of looking for land. We are, um, we found quite a bit of land, but nothing that we, we actually want. A lot of it has been overgrown with laws or CCNRs that restrict a lot of things in there. Um, what I may do is I am actually compiling a list of some of the most interesting CCNRs. And I'm going to do a video, I think, on that. If that's something that you guys would kind of like to hear or something that would be fun for you guys, go ahead and leave a comment down below. But what you guys really came for today was Jim Butcher's Changes. Book 12 of the Dresden Files. This is the last one. Um, I'll be reading for a little while. We do have a ton of other books coming out, um, including some of the uh, Raid Bradbury's, um, I think like uh, 1984, um, some of the things. I, we're currently trying to find out about uh, Fahrenheit 451 and a few of those other books like that and seeing what the copyright laws are on those ones. But let me go ahead here. We are on chapter 35. So if you guys can go ahead and grab your copies of the book, like, share, and subscribe, let's go ahead and get started. By the time Murphy and I had moved into the hall, gunfire had erupted on the floors below us. It didn't sound like much. Simple staccato thumping sounds. But anyone who'd heard shots fired in earnest would never mistake them for anything else. I hoped that nobody was carrying rounds heavy enough to come up through the intervening floors and nail me. There just aren't any minor injuries to be had from something like that. Those screams, Murphy said. Red Court, right? Yeah. Where's Susan? Interrogation room. That way. She nodded to the left, and I took the lead. I walked with my shoulder brushing the left-hand wall. Murph, after dragging the sputtering Rudolph out of the office, walked a step behind me and a pace to my right, so that she could shoot past me if she had to. We'd played this game before. If something bad came for us, I'd stand it off long enough to give her a clean shot. That would be critical. Buying her the extra seconds to place her shot. Vampires aren't immune to the damage bullets cause, but if they can recover from anything but the most lethal hits, and they know it. A red court vampire would almost always be willing to charge a mortal gunman, knowing how difficult it is to really place a shot with lethal effect, especially with a howling monster rushing toward you. You need a hit square in the head, severing the spine, or in the gut, rupturing the blood reservoir to really put a red court vampire down. And they could generally recover even from those wounds with enough time and blood to feed upon. Murphy knew exactly what she was shooting at 
and had proved that she could be steady enough to deal with a red. But the other personnel in the building lacked her knowledge and experience. The FBI was in for a real bad day. We moved down the hall, quick and silent. And when a frightened-looking clerical type stumbled out of a break room doorway toward us, I nearly sent a blast of flame through her. Murphy had her badge hanging around her neck, and she instructed her to get back inside and barricade the door. She was clearly terrified and responded without question to the tone of calm authority in Murph's voice. Maybe we should do that, Rudolph said. Get in a room. Barricade the door. They've got a heavy with them, I said to Murphy as I took the lead again. Big, strong, fast, like the loop guru. It's some kind of Mayan thing, an ix something or other. Murphy cursed. How do we kill it? Not sure. But daylight seems a pretty good bet. We were passing down a hallway that had several offices with exterior windows. The light of the autumn afternoon, reduced by the occasional curtain, created a kind of murky twilight to move through, and one that my ambient blue wizard light did little to disperse. Earlier, eerier than the lightning, was the silence. No air ducts sighed, no elevators rattled, no phones rang, but twice I heard gunshots. The rapid bang, bang, bang of practically useless panic fire. Vampires shrieked out their hunting cries several different times, and the thud dud of the ick's bizarre heartbeat was steady, omnipresent, and slowly growing louder. Maybe we need a lot of mirrors or something, Murphy said. Bring a bunch of daylight in. Way harder to do that than it looks in the movies, I said. I figure I'll just blow open a hole in the side of the building. I licked my lips. Crud. Uh, which way is south? That'll be the best side to do it on. You're threatening to destroy a federal building, Rudolph squeaked. Gunshots sounded somewhere close maybe on the third floor, directly below us, maybe on the other side of the fourth floor, muffled by a lot of cubicle walls. Oh, God, Rudolph whimpered. Oh, dear, sweet Jesus. He just started repeating that in a mindless, frightened whisper. Ah, I said as we reached the interrogation room. We have our cowardly lion. Cover me, Dorothy. Remind me to ask... What the hell you're talking about later, Murphy said. I started to open the door, but paused. Tilly was armed, presumably smart enough to be scared, and it probably wasn't the best idea in the world to just open the door of the room and scare him. So I moved as far as possible to one side, reached way over to the door, and knocked, in code even. Shave and a haircut. There was a lengthy pause, and then someone knocked on the other side of the door. Two bits. I twisted the knob and opened the door very, very slowly. Tilly? I said in a hoarse whisper. Susan? The interrogation room didn't have any windows, and it was completely dark inside. Tilly appeared in the doorway, holding up a hand to shield his eyes. Dresden? Yeah. Obviously, I said. Susan? I'm here, she said from the darkness, her voice shaking with fear. I'm cuffed to the chair, Harry. We've got to go. Working on it, I said quietly. You don't understand. That thing, that drumming sound, it's a devourer. You don't fight them. You run and pray someone slower than you attacks and attracts its attention. Yeah, already met the ick, I said. I'd rather not repeat the experience. I held out a hand to Tilly. I need the cuff keys. Tilly hesitated, clearly torn between his sense of duty and order and the primal fear that had risen in the building. He shook his head, but it didn't seem like his heart was in it. Tilly? Murphy said she turned to him, her expression 
ferociously determined and said, trust me, please just do it. People are going to die as long as these three are in the building. He passed me the keys. I took them over to Susan, who was sitting in the same chair I had during my chat with the feds. She wore her dark leather pants and black t-shirt and looked oddly vulnerable just sitting there during a situation like this. I went to her and started unfastening the cuffs. Thank you, she said quietly. I was getting a little worried there. They must have come in through the basement somehow, I said. She nodded. They'll work their way up, floor by floor. Kill everyone they can. It's how they operate. Remove the target and leave a message for everyone else. Tilly shook his head as if dazed. That's... what? That's how some of the cartels operate in Colombia, Venezuela, but... Susan gave him an impatient look and shook her head. What have I been telling you for the last 15 minutes? A vampire let out a haunting scream. One not inter interjected by floors. They're here, Susan whispered as she rubbed at her newly freed wrists. We have to move. I stopped for a moment and then I said quietly, they'll just keep on killing until they find the target, floor by floor, I said. Susan nodded tightly. I bit my lip. So if we run, they'll keep going all the way up? Murphy turned her head to look at me, then jerked her eyes back out to the hallway, weary. Fight? We won't win, I said, certain. Not here, on their timing. They've got all the advantages. But we can't just abandon all those people, either. She took a deep breath and let it out slowly. No, we can't, Murph said. So what are we going to do? Does anyone have an extra weapon? Susan asked. No one said anything, and she nodded turned to the heavy conference table and flipped it over with one hand. She tore off a heavy steel leg as if it had been attached with a kindergartner's glue rather than high-grade steel boat bolts. Tilly stared, his mouth open. Then he said very quietly, Ah. Susan whirled the table leg once, testing its balance, and nodded. It will do. I grunted, and then I said, Here's the plan. We're going to show ourselves to the vampires and the ick. We're going to hit whoever they have out front with everything we have and squash them flat. That should make sure we have the attention of the entire strike team. Yes, Murphy said in a dry tone. That's brilliant. I made a face at her. Once they're good and interested, you... Tilly and Rudolph are going to split off from the rest of us and hit the nearest emergency exit. If it comes down to it, you probably have better odds of surviving a jump out the window than you do staying in here. You with me? Murphy frowned. What about you? Susan, me, and your stunt doubles are going to jump over into the never-never and try to draw the bad guys after us. Stunt doubles? Murphy asked. We are? Susan asked, alarmed. Sure. I need your mighty foos to protect me. You being super chick and all. Okay, Susan said, eyeing me as if she thought I was losing my mind. Which, hey, I admit, totally possible. What's on the other side? No clue, I said. And a touch to my mother's gem told me that she hadn't ever actually been in this building on her dimension-hopping jaunts. We'll hope it isn't an ocean of acid or a patch of cloud 5,000 feet above a big rock. Susan's eyes widened slightly, and then she shot me a wolfish smile. I love this plan. Thought you would, I said. Meanwhile, you three get out. Does this place have an exterior fire escape? Rudolph just rocked back and forth, making soft moaning noises. Tilly still looked stunned at what he had just seen from Susan. Murphy cuffed him lightly on the back of the head. Hey, Barry. Tilly shook his head and looked at her. 
Fire escape. Uh, no. Find a stairwell, then, I told Murphy. Go quiet and fast, in case some of them were too stupid to follow me. Murphy nodded and gave Tilly's shoulder a little shake. Hey, Tilly, you're in charge of Rudolph. All right. Keep him moving and out of any lines of fire. The slender little man nodded, slowly at first, and then more rapidly as he seemed to take control of himself. Okay, I'm his nanny. Got it. Murphy gave him part of a grin and a firm nod. Right, I said. Is this a great plan or what? I'm point. Murph, you've got my six. Susan, you ride drag. Got it, Susan said. The faint, const constant drumbeat of the ick's throbbing heart got fractionally louder. Go, I said, and hit the hallways again. At my request, Tilly steered us toward the central staircase running parallel to the elevator shafts, because I figured it would make sense for the most of the strike team to use the central stairwell, while the others were covered by maybe a single guard. We ran into another handful of people who were hovering, uncertain of what to do, and who looked at me in a manner that suggested they would find my advice less than credible. Tilly? I said, half-pleading. Tilly nodded and started speaking in a calm, authoritative tone. There's some kind of attack underway. Tammy, you and Joe and Mickey need to get to one of the offices with a window. You got that? A window. Take the curtains down. Let the light in. Barricade the door and sit tight. He looked at me and said, Helps on the way? I swapped a look with Murphy, who nodded confidently at me. Tilly had gotten the supernatural shoved in his face pretty hard, but he'd rebounded with tremendous agility. Or maybe he'd simply cracked. I guessed we'd eventually see. The federal personnel scurried to obey Tilly, running down the hall we'd just come from. If we'd been about ten seconds slower, the vampire would have found them first instead of us. I heard a scream, shrill and terrible meant to send a jolt of terrorized surprise through the prey so that the vampire could close upon it. It really said something about the Red Court, that simple tactic. Animals would never have been startled into immobility that way. It takes a thinking mind, trying to reason its way to what was happening, to fall for a psychological ploy like that one. And it probably said something about me that it completely failed to startle me. Or maybe it wasn't that big a deal. As the scarecrow, I felt that I had amply proven that I didn't have much of a brain to which to be messed. So instead of finding a helpless target waiting for him, the Red Court Vampire found a field of ambient, invisible power as I brought my shield up, and while it might have supernatural strength that didn't increase its mass... It bounced off my shield like any other body would have abruptly meeting someone's front bumper at 50 or 60 miles an hour. There was a flash of blue light, and I released the shield with a little English on it, tossing the vampire to sprawl on the ground, on the right side of the hallway squarely in Murphy's line of fire, and started moving forward again. Murphy calmly put two bullets into the vampire's head, which made an unholy mess of the wall behind it. She put two more into the blood-gored belly on the way by, and as Susan passed, I heard an ugly, moist sound of impact. Tully stood there staring for a second, frozen. Then Susan nudged him into motion again. The agent grabbed Rudolph and dragged him after Murphy and me. We found the first human body several steps later, a glassy-eyed young woman covered in her own blood, Beyond her, a man in a suit laid sprawled on his face in death, and the corpses of two more women lay within a few feet of him. There was the most furative of sounds from the darkened supply closet near an intersection of hallways, its doorway gaping wide open. I didn't let on that I'd heard it. You know what? I said quietly to no one in particular. That makes me mad. I turned with my blasting rod's runes blazing into sudden life and roared, Fuego! A spear 
of white hot fire erupted from the rod, blowing through the interior wall in a concussive chorus of shattered materials. I slewed it along the length of the closet at waist height, cutting through the wall like an enormous buzzsaw. A surprised scream of inhuman agony greeted my efforts, and I spun in place at once, bringing up the shield again. A second vampire bounded around the intersection ahead, running on all fours along the wall, and threw itself at me. At the same time, another of the rubbery-backed creatures exploded out of an air vent I would have sworn was too tiny to contain it, coming down from almost straight overhead. I rebounded the first vamp from my shield, as I had only moments before, and Murphy's gun began to bark the instant it bounced off the wall and to the floor. I couldn't get my shield up in time to stop the one plunging down from overhead. It landed on me, a horrible, squishy weight. And with the crystalline perceptions of surging adrenaline, I saw its jaws dropping open, nightmarishly wide, unhinged like a snake's. Its fangs gleamed. Black claws on all four limbs were poised to rake, and its two-foot-long tongue lashed at me as well, seeking exposed skin in order to deliver its stupefying venom. I went down to the floor on my face, hurriedly covering my head with my arms. The vampire raked at me furiously, but the defensive spells on my duster held and prevented its claws from scouring. The vampire shifted tactics quickly, tossing me over like a rodeo cowboy taking down a calf. The writhing, slimy tongue lashed at my face, now vulnerable. Susan's hand closed on that tongue in mid-motion, and with a twist of her wrist and shoulders, she ripped it out of the vampire's mouth. The vampire threw its head back and shrieked, and my ex-sweetie's improvised mace smashed its skull down into its torso. The vampire in the closet, still out of sight, continued to wail its agony as I rose again and checked around me to make sure everyone was there. Anyone hurt? We're, we're, we're fine, Tilly said. For a guy who had just had a couple of close encounters with imaginary creatures, he seemed to be fairly coherent. Rudolph had retreated to his happy place and just kept on rocking, crying, and whispering. What about you, Dresden? Peachy. Mervy turned toward the closet, her face grim, her gun in her hand. I shook my head at her. No, let it scream. It'll draw the others to us and away from anyone else. Murphy looked at me for a moment, frowning gently, but nodded. God, that's cold, Harry. I lost my warm fuzzies for the Reds a long time ago, I said. The wounded vampire just wouldn't shut up. Fire's tough on them. Their outer layer of skin is combustible. My attack had probably left it in two pieces, or otherwise parred down its body mass. It would be a smoldering lump of agony writhing on the floor, in so much pain that it could literally do nothing but scream. And that suited me just fine. We aren't just standing here, are we? Tilly asked. A pair of peculiar, loud, simultaneously shrieks came through the vents and shafts, ululating over the and under each other. They were particularly strident and piercing, and went on for longer than the others. A chorus of lesser shrieks wailed briefly in reply. The Ebes, as generals, sending orders to the troops, it had to be coordinating the raid and directing it toward the injured member of the team. Indeed, we are not. All right, folks. Murph, Tilly, Rudolph, get scarce. Follow Murphy and do whatever the hell she tells you to do if you want to get out of this alive. Murphy grimaced at that. Be careful, Dresden. You too, I said. See you at the church? She gave me a sharp nod, beckoned Tilly, and the two of them started off down another hallway to one side of the stairwells. With any luck, the Ebes had just sent everyone they had running toward me. Even if Murphy and Tilly weren't lucky, I figured they'd probably have only a single sentry to deal with, at the most. I gave Murphy even odds of handling that. 
A 50% chance of survival wasn't real encouraging, but it was about 50% higher than if they'd stayed. Susan watched them go and then looked at me. You and Murphy never hooked up? You're asking this now? I demanded. Should I fix us both a nice cup of tea? Our copious free time? I rolled my eyes and shook my head. No, we haven't. Why not? She asked. A lot of, ba of reasons. Bad timing, other relationships. You know. I took a deep breath and said, Keep an eye out. I've got to pull off something hard here. Right, Susan said. She went back to watching the gloom her club held ready. I closed my eyes and summoned up my will. Time for some real razzle-dazzle stuff. Illusions are a fascinating branch of magic. There are two basic ways to manage them. One, you can create an image and put it in someone else's head. There's no actual visible object there, but their brain tells them that there is. Big as life, a phantasm. It's walking real close to the borders of the laws of magic to go that way. But it could be very effective. The second method is the creation of an actual physical object or creature. A kind of hologram. Those things are much harder to produce because you have to put a lot more energy into them. And while a phantasm uses a foe's own mind to create consistency within the illusion... You've got to do it the hard way with holomancy. Murphy's image was easy to fix in mind, as was Rudolph's, though I admit that I might have made him look a bit skinnier and slouchier than he actually might have been. My holomancy, my rules. The hardest was Tilly. I kept getting the image of the actor from the X-Files, confabulated with the actual Tilly, and the final result was kind of marginal but I was in a rush. I pictured the images with as much clarity as I could and sent my will, including a tiny bit of soul fire, into creating the mirages. Soul fire isn't really a destructive force. It's sort of the opposite, actually. And while I use it in fights to enhance my offensive spells, it really shone when creating things. I whispered, Lumen, Camerus, Factum and released energy into the mental images, the holograms of Murphy, Tilly, and Rudolph. Shimmered into existence, so absolutely real-looking that even I thought they might have been solid matter. They're coming, Susan said abruptly. She turned to me and practically jumped out of her shoes upon seeing the illusions. Then she waved a hand at Tilly's image, and it flickered straight through. She let out a low whistle and said, Time to go? The thunder of the Ix heart grew abruptly louder, a vibration I could feel through the soles of my shoes. Vampires, bullied out of the central stairwell, a sudden tide of flabby, rubbery black bodies and all black eyes, of spotted pink tongues and gleaming fangs. At their center, in their flesh-masked forms, were Esteban and Esmeralda. And looming behind them was the Ick. Susan and I turned and sprinted. The three illusions did the same thing, complete with the sounds of running footfalls and heavy breathing. With a group howl, the vampires came after us. I ran as hard as I could, drawing up more of my will. I should have been f feeling some of the strain by now, but I wasn't. Go, go, gadget. Oh. Fastian bargain. I gathered my will, shouted, Apartum, and slashed at the air down the hallway with my right hand. I used a lot of energy to open the way, and it tore wide, a diagonal rip in the fabric of space, crooked and off center to the hallway. It hung there, like some kind of oddly geometric cloud of mist, and I pointed at it, shouting wordlessly to Susan. She shouted something back, nodding while behind us the vampires gained ground with every second. We both screamed in a frenzy of wild fear and rampant adrenaline and hit the way moving at a dead run. We plunged through. 
into empty air. I let out a shriek as I fell and figured I'd finally taken my last desperate gamble. But after less than a second, my flailing limbs hit solid stone and I dropped into a roll. I came back to my feet and kept running through what appeared to be a spacious cavern of some kind, and Susan ran beside me. We didn't run far. A wall loomed up out of the blackness and we barely stopped in time to keep from braining ourselves against us. Jesus, Susan said, panting. Have you been working out? I turned. Blasting rod in hand and ready to wait for the first of the pursuing vampires to appear. There were shrieks and wails and the sound of scrabbling claws, but none of them emerged from the shadows. Which just couldn't have been good. Susan and I stood there, a solid wall to our backs, unsure of what to do next. And then a soft green light began to rise. It intensified slowly, coming from nowhere and everywhere at the same time. And within a few seconds, I realized that we weren't in a cave. We were in a hall. A medieval dining hall, to be precise. It was staring at a double row of trestle tables that stretched down the length of the hall, easily better than a hundred yards, leaving an open aisle between them. Seated at the tables were... things. And there was a curious similarity among them though no two of the creatures were the same. They were vaguely humanoid. They wore cloth and leather and armor, all of it inscribed with odd geometric shapes and colors that could only with difficulty be differentiated from black. Some of them were tall and emaciated, some squat and muscular, some medium-sized, and every combination in between. Some of the creatures had huge ears or no ears or odd saggy chins. None of them carried the beauty of symmetry. Their similarity was in mismatchedness, each. Individual's body at aesthetic war with itself. One thing was the same. They all had gleaming red eyes, and if ever a gang looked evil, these beings did. They had one other thing in common. They were all armed with knives, swords, axes, and other crueler impediments of battle. Susan and I had come in sprinting down the center aisle between the tables. We must have startled our hosts, who reacted only in time to catch the second batch of intruders to come through. And catch them, they had. Some of the largest of the beings, easily weighing half a ton themselves, had piled onto the ick and held it pinned to the earth. Nearby, the mob of vampires were lumped more or less together, each one entangled in nets made out of some material that I could only describe as flexible barbed wire. Only Esteban and Esmeralda stood on their feet back to back, between the ick and the netted minions. There was blood on the floor near them, and two of the native creatures were lying still upon the floor. Jesus, Susan whispered, what are those things? I, I swallowed. I think they're goblins. You think? I've never seen one before, I replied, but they match the descriptions I've heard. Uh, shouldn't we be able to handle, like, a million of them? I snorted. You like those movies too, huh? Her reply was a smile, one touched with sadness. Yeah, I said. I was thinking of you when I saw them too. I shook my head. And no, this is a case of folklore getting it wrong. These guys are killers. They're sneaky and they're smart and they're ruthless, like ninjas from Krypton. Look what they did. Susan stared at the downed red court strike team for a moment. I watched the wheels turn in her head as she processed what had happened to the vampires and the ick and a handful of seconds in complete darkness and in total silence. Um, I guess we'd better make nice then, huh? Susan asked. She slipped her club around behind her back and put on her old reporter's smile, the one she used to disarm hostile interviews. And then I had a thought. A horrible, horrible thought. I turned slowly around. I looked at the wall I'd been standing against. And then I looked up. It wasn't a wall. 
exactly. It was a dais, a big one, atop a great stone throne. And upon the throne sat a figure in black armor, covered from head to toe. He was huge, nine feet tall at least, and had a lean, athletic look to him despite the armor. His helm covered his head and veiled his face with darkness, and great, savagely pointed antlers rose up from the helmet, though. Whether they were adornment or appendage, I couldn't say. Within the visor of that helmet was a pair of steady red eyes, eyes that matched the thousands of others in the hall. He leaned forward. The Lord of the Goblins of Fairy, leader of the Wild Hunt, nightmare of story and legend, and peer of the Queen of Air and Darkness, Mab herself. Well, murmured the Earl King. Well, well, isn't this interesting? <whistles> so... The Earl King isn't <clears throat> on any side. N you know, he's not summer. He's not winter. He's kind of one of the outliers. Um, that's kind of scary. So I wonder what's going to happen to Dresden. Or is the Earl King going to be happy that Dresden brought in such this, th this excellent wild hunt all of a sudden for them to do. The Earl King's kind of hard to guess, but maybe you guys can. Leave comments down below and let's see what's going to happen in the next chapter. Again, thank you guys so very much for making this possible, for um, helping me to be able to be on this channel and do the things that I can do for you guys. And thank you guys for being part of this channel. You all have a wonderful, wonderful and blessed day.